Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, and this episode was produced with the support of William & Mary and the American Indian Initiative at Colonial Williamsburg. Well, the Brafferton and I would say early schools like the Indian College at Harvard, they were the foundation for what would come later. If we examine the Indian boarding schools of the late 19th and early 20th century, we can see some of the same policies being put into action. The way they were taught is similar, with the purpose or the final goal being that they would be assimilated into mainstream American society, just like the goal with Brafferton to assimilate these children and make them over as English subjects. But I think Brafferton is really one of the foundational schools where this policy of educating to assimilate continues into the 1950s. The Brafferton Indian School has a long and complicated legacy. Chartered with the College of William & Mary in 1693, the Brafferton Indian School's purpose was to educate young indigenous boys in the ways of English religion, language, and culture. The Brafferton performed this work for more than 70 years, between the arrival of its first students in 1702 and when the last documented student left the school in 1778. As we discussed in our last episode, episode 367, the Brafferton Indian School was not the first Indian school the English established. The records of the legislature in Jamestown, Virginia, reflected the English government in London sent instructions for this early Virginia government to establish an Indian school in 1619. In the 1650s, the overseers of Harvard College, what is now Harvard University, opened an Indian school, quote, for the education of the English and Indian youth of this country, end quote. And these are just two of the earliest English schools for educating North America's indigenous youth. There were also many other schools founded by the English and colonial governments and the founders of early American educational institutions as well. Now, all of these colonial period Indian schools differed from each other in terms of the emphasis they placed on religious education and conversion and educating indigenous boys in English language, culture, and treaties. Still, the legacy of all these schools is that they assisted the United States in continuing centuries-old practices of colonialism and empire building. These schools offered historical examples from which Americans drew as they established and operated Indian boarding schools within the United States between the mid-19th and mid-20th centuries. This second episode in our two-episode series about the Brafferton Indian School will focus on the legacy of the Brafferton Indian School and how it and other colonial-era Indian schools established models for the schools the United States government and religious institutions established during the Indian boarding school era. As one of the architects of these later boarding schools, Richard Henry Pratt, stated, the purpose of these schools was to, quote, kill the Indian and save the man, end quote. What Pratt meant was the United States government desired to assimilate and fully Americanize indigenous children so that within a few generations, there would be no more Native Americans. Their cultures would be wiped out and only Americans would exist. But indigenous peoples are resilient and they have resisted American attempts to extinguish their cultures. So we'll also hear from three tribal citizens in Virginia who are working in different ways to reawaken long dormant aspects of their indigenous cultures. So what does the history of the United States' Indian boarding schools look like? I'm Brooke Bauer. I'm a citizen of the Catawba Nation, which is located just about 25 miles south of Charlotte, North Carolina. I am a potter, and I learned to make Catawba pottery from a long line of really brilliant Catawba women. I'm also an assistant professor of history at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, where I teach courses on Native American history, including courses that focus on Native American women, Indian termination, and Native schooling. Brooke also recently wrote and published a book called Becoming Catawba, Catawba Indian Women in Nation Building, 1540 to 1840. So in terms of Brafferton, the typical model for these schools included instructing boys in the tenets of Christianity, 
They learned to read from the Bible. They would have learned to write English. They would have learned the basics of math. The goal of these early Indian schools was to maintain peace, civilize the native boys, make them over in the English image, instill Christianity. Colonial leaders hoped that when the children returned to their villages, they would teach their relatives to be good Christians. Whether you were looking at colonial English, later British America, or the history of the United States, you will find that the governments of both the British Empire and the United States faced what they termed as the, quote, Indian problem. Simply put, the Indian problem served as a shorthand that Europeans and Americans used to describe four Eurocentric and American-centric ideas. Firstly, Europeans, Anglo-Americans, and white United States citizens were civilized, and indigenous people were savages. Secondly, as savages, indigenous people were without a Christian god. With God's help, Christians learned to work hard and use land for industrious purposes like farming to provide for one's family. In the view of white settlers and government officials, indigenous people did not make good moral use of their land, land that white people needed to advance their North American societies. Thirdly, the Christian God had ordained that white Europeans, Anglo-Americans, and United States citizens were destined to advance their civilization across the North American continent and to settle all of its lands in his name. Therefore, it was the duty of these white colonists and settlers to dispossess indigenous peoples from their lands so that they could use them for industrious purposes, such as farming and spreading civilized societies throughout the continent. And fourthly, as white colonists and settlers were Christians, it was their responsibility to help civilize indigenous peoples by educating them in the ways of English, later American society, and then culturally assimilating indigenous peoples into those societies. And by assimilation, white Europeans and Americans meant teaching indigenous peoples Christian religion, how to be industrious with their agricultural, domestic, and other work, and the English language. In terms of the Brafferton legacy, I think there are connections to the 18th and 19th century. I don't think you can sever that connection because the policies, even though it's from one empire to another, from the British Empire to the American Empire, the Indian policy is the same. This has been the policy since day one. They're not Christians. We need to change them. But I think Brafferton also needs to be looked at within its own time. The legacy there is that a lot of these native children from Catawba, from Cherokee, from the Meharan, they all went on to fill really important roles within their society that benefited their people and their tribe and helped protect the sovereignty of their tribes. I think that's one of the legacies that is a positive way of looking at this. Important differences exist between the English and British colonial era Indian schools and the boarding schools established and operated by the United States government and Christian religious institutions between the mid-19th and mid-20th centuries. Firstly, the colonial era English schools were heavily influenced by English styles of diplomacy. These early schools attempted to anglicize young indigenous boys without fully severing the boys' links to their indigenous cultures. The English wanted and needed indigenous boys to serve as translators and cultural brokers between the English and their indigenous communities, whereas the later American boarding schools worked to fully assimilate and Americanize young indigenous boys and girls by completely severing their ties to their indigenous tribes, communities, and cultures. Secondly, in the case of the Brafferton Indian School, Tribes were invited to send an adult man with their students to look out for the boys and to help them retain their ability to speak their indigenous language. In the later boarding school era, the United States government passed laws in the 1870s and 1880s that made it legal for the government to kidnap and remove indigenous children from their parents, grandparents, and communities and place these children in boarding schools for their education and protection. Further, once in these boarding schools, 
School administrators burned all of the children's handmade clothing and moccasins. They cut their hairstyles so they would conform with American hairstyles. And they also beat any student caught speaking an indigenous language. Thirdly, whereas most of the colonial era schools taught boys exclusively, the U.S. era boarding schools taught both boys and girls. Now, aside from these important differences, the colonial era and U.S. era Indian schools shared many similarities. The Brafferton and I would say early schools like the Indian College at Harvard, they were the foundation for what would come later. If we examine the Indian boarding schools of the late 19th and early 20th century, we can see some of the same policies being put into action. The way they were taught is similar. So at these boarding schools, girls, they did domestic chores for half of the day. Boys, they worked in the field or worked with livestock for half of the day. And then the other half of the day was spent learning English, writing, and math, with the final goal being that they would be assimilated into mainstream American society. In addition to their curriculums being similar, the colonial era schools and the later boarding schools also sought to impart Christian religion. They want to teach them about Christianity. They want to hopefully convert them to Christianity so that when the children return to their homes, the hope was that they would spread the gospel to their people. And then in turn, their people would be good Christians. They wouldn't fight the English. So they would learn from the Bible. That's how they learned how to read. And that's how they learned to write English. The establishment of the colonial era's Indian schools and the United States' Indian boarding schools coincided with intense periods of violence and warfare between indigenous peoples and colonists and settlers. In both periods, these wars bear titles with tribal designations. The First, Second, and Third Powhatan Wars, the Pequot War, the Tuscarora War, the First, Second, and Third Seminole War, the Apache Wars, and the Sioux Wars, just to name a few of these conflicts. We should note that colonial and U.S. governments named these wars, and they did name them to make indigenous peoples appear as the aggressors or bad guys. Yet all of these wars began as white colonists and settlers encroached upon and dispossessed native peoples of their land. Now, during these many intense periods of warfare, English and American officials turned to education as something that might help them create and keep peace. So why the English created the Indian schools to educate indigenous children? It was really important to colonial leaders, governors specifically, to secure the areas where white settlers lived. These early Indian schools are 100% about controlling Indian nations. It was a power play by the English. It was their way of trying to guarantee that native leaders and the men of those communities, the fighters in those communities, would stay in line and wouldn't go against the colony. Because if I have your child and I'm holding your child in my house, you're going to be less inclined to make any kind of attack on the house as a group because the child might be hurt. Or, heaven forbid, that the people holding these children might kill them. They might sell them as slaves. Like the English, U.S. government officials still believe, nearly 200 years later, the Indian boarding schools would help keep powerful indigenous nations like the Lakota, Diné, and Apache in check by educating their children to love the United States and American culture while at the same time holding their children as sureties for good behavior. The 19th century Indian boarding schools came about primarily because it was the time period that the Indian wars were coming to a close and military leaders and church leaders were looking towards these native men who had been fighting in these Indian wars 
and saying, you know, we can't teach them. We need to start at a younger age. The history is a lot more complex than that, but this is basically when and why the school starts because those leaders want the children to be taught Christianity. They want these native children to learn English. They want them to be able to recite the Pledge of Allegiance and to sing songs about America. And this will ensure that if there's a potential for an Indian war in the future, that it may not happen because we've not only converted these children to Christianity, but we've converted them into our society. Just as the English experienced resistance and refusal from indigenous peoples to send their boys to the colonial era Indian schools, indigenous peoples also expressed reluctance and refusal to send their children to the boarding schools operated by the United States government and Christian missionaries. And like the English government, which resorted to recruiting students through coercive acts and treaties and tribute remission. The United States government also resorted to student recruitment through coercion and what historian Ned Blackhawk calls a new politics of hunger. Some of the early recruitment came from when Geronimo was captured and some of his men, along with their families, were transported and eventually ended up in St. Augustine in prison there. The children of those families were sent to the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. After this, a lot of the focus was toward Western tribes like the Arapaho, the Comanche, and leaders, missionaries, and reservation Indian agents went in to the homes and said, you have to send your child to Carlisle. If you don't, we're cutting your rations. Again, this is coerced. It's, you can either send your child and keep your child fed well, or you can keep your child and starve to death. So that was the choice. Where the English believed that indigenous peoples and English colonists could maintain more peaceful relations through treaty making and diplomacy, if each indigenous community had some people who understood English ways and language, those in the later United States believed that the only way citizens of the United States and indigenous peoples could live together peacefully was if they eradicated indigenous culture through the education and assimilation of native children. The Carlisle Indian Industrial School. It opened in the old barracks that were used during the American Revolution, a Hessian jail. It had no windows, only a door, so no light filtered in. And children were often placed in that building for punishment, where they were forced to remain for 24 hours without food, without any kind of natural light. That was their punishment for speaking their own language. Carlisle's founder was Richard Henry Pratt, who was a military man and had led Geronimo and his men to St. Augustine in Florida. The U.S. War Department had a crucial role in the boarding school. A lot of the funding came through the military, and at this time, Indian Affairs was in the War Department. Thousands of Native children went through the doors of that school. And the school closed in 1918 because of the First World War. The United States wanted or needed a hospital for returning soldiers. And those barracks were the perfect place for the soldiers. So they cut off the funding. Other schools stayed open, both off-reservation and on-reservation schools. They stayed open well into the mid-20th century. Those later boarding schools would close because parents refused to send their children. They knew the kind of trauma because maybe some of them had gone to the earlier boarding schools and they understood what was going on. Richard Henry Pratt, 
founded the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879 to teach indigenous children how to be productive American adults. Students were taught English, math, history, drawing, and composition. They learned skills in farming and manufacturing, and they were required to learn about Christianity and attend daily church services at one of the local churches in Carlisle. Pratt designed the school as the ultimate Americanizer. Students were required to adopt American names, and they followed a military-inspired schedule each day of their attendance. The teachers at Carlisle punished students who used their indigenous names or indigenous languages, and students were encouraged to turn each other in when they heard and saw infractions of the school's conduct code. Americans and their government praised and supported Pratt's methods. The Carlisle Indian Industrial School became the model for an additional 26 off-reservation boarding schools in 15 different states and territories. However, the school's indigenous students often found little to praise about these schools. These boarding schools completely sever these children from their communities. Not just family relations, but they sever them from their culture. They lose contact with their spirituality that their people believe in. They lose their language. And when they go back home, they can no longer speak their language. Then they're kind of outsiders in their own families. They don't have a place where they fit in. And they definitely don't fit in to white society. So it's not just going to and being in these schools. It's what happens afterwards. Some students were successful and they were able to advocate successfully for their tribes. But a lot of these children returned home and just never found a way to fit into their community again. From the American perspective, boarding schools like Carlisle achieved some success. They converted many indigenous peoples to Christianity, and they taught them English literacy and how to behave like good Americans. Some of the students went on to study at Dickinson College, graduating with college and law degrees. Others went on to serve in the United States military, and still others went to work in the Philadelphia shipyard. But few felt they found their place in the world. Pratt's philosophy of killing the Indian by cultural assimilation didn't turn indigenous people into white people, even when they trained indigenous children in American culture. Whites did not accept them. And when many boarding school students returned to their tribe's reservations, they also found themselves out of place. And some students never even made it home because they never lived long enough to finish school. A lot of times they were neglected. They're housing a lot of children in one room. So there's overcrowdedness. And we know that when a lot of people live in one space, then disease spreads because it's unsanitary. A lot of the children develop trachoma, which is an eye disease that can result in blindness and death. A little Catawba boy who died at Carlisle, his name was Wade Ayers. He was 13 years old when he died. He had only been at Carlisle six months. According to the records, he died of a vaccination, probably a smallpox vaccination, but we don't know for sure. All we know from the record is that he's described as getting a cold in his arm and then died shortly thereafter. There might have been a little bit more than that going on. I think about Wade As a 13-year-old, the thing he probably wished the most for was to have his mother by his side to comfort him, to tell him it's going to be okay. And he never got that. Between 1819 and 1969, the United States government ran or supported 408 boarding schools. These schools existed in 37 states or territories, including 21 schools in Alaska and seven in Hawaii. 53 of these school sites contain marked and unmarked burial sites for the indigenous children like Wade Ayers, who died while attending these boarding schools. For a long time, it was thought that indigenous cultures, traditions, practices were going to end because this generation that went to these boarding schools 
lack the knowledge. But what I see is as these children grew up and they started having children of their own, those children were able to retain some of the culture. I think one of the legacies of these 19th and 20th century boarding schools is that a lot of tribal communities lost their languages, lost a lot of their oral histories, lost some traditional customs. The other legacy is that in spite of this loss, or maybe because of this loss, tribes have been resilient and they have survived. And a lot of these tribes, like the Cherokee, their language is endangered, but they have several programs going, hoping to save the language. Similar here in Catawba, we have after-school programs in which the children are taught their language. Indigenous peoples have shown and continue to show great resilience in the face of what historian David Wallace Adams called the United States' policy of education for extinction. And some of the most incredible stories of resilience and persistence of indigenous peoples can be seen in the efforts of some of Virginia's tribal nations to learn more about their histories by collecting and passing on oral histories, teaching traditional cultural practices, and reawakening one of their long dormant languages, Senecomica Algonquian. Hello, my friends. My name is Raven. I come from the Mattapanai in Virginia. Professionally, I'm an adult gerontology primary care nurse practitioner. I proudly work at the only tribal health clinic currently in Virginia, the Upper Mattapanai's Aylet Family Wellness. Culturally, I'm an enrolled Mattapanai tribal citizen, and I was born and raised on the Mattapanai Indian Reservation in King William County. I also descend from the Rappahannock tribe through my paternal great-grandmother. I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by cultural bearers and knowledge holders throughout my youth and into my adulthood. Raven Costello is also a co-founder of Eastern Woodland Revitalization, a 501c3 nonprofit that functions as a tribal services organization. Eastern Woodland Revitalization works with different tribal communities and organizes classes to teach old and new ways of tribal life. Raven is also the president of the Senecomica Algonquian Language Project, and earlier this year, in 2023, Nextar Media Group awarded her its Most Remarkable Woman for Richmond Award. We have 11 total tribes in Virginia. There are, I believe, seven federally recognized and four state recognized. So we have our federal tribes, our Upper Mappanai, Pamunkey, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Monacan, Nansman, and Rappahannock. And then you have your four state recognized, which are Mattapanai, Patawomek, Cherenaka Nottaway, and Nottaways of Virginia. The Mattapanai Reservation was established in 1658, so it's one of the oldest reservations in America. It sits in King William County, Virginia. It's about 125 acres with some of that wetland, so it's not usable for living. There's about 30 households there, maybe about 60 tribal members. However, the tribe itself consists of probably over 400 or more tribal citizens, and they're scattered throughout Virginia and even into other states. Like many indigenous peoples, the Mattapanai have been dispossessed of their original homelands and have found a need and a desire to wake up their ancestral culture. Our ancestral homelands were in the Tidewater region, not necessarily King William only. We've been displaced and moved around. So prior to that, you'll find us down in Gloucester County throughout the Northern Neck. I believe colonial journals will talk about eight Mattapanai towns scattered throughout the Tidewater region. You know, it's a beautiful area. The reservation sits on the bluff overlooking the Mattapanai River. So at least we were able to continue that connection to the land and the water that was so important to our people and our survival. My grandmother, Christine Rippling Water Custolo, she's a famous Mattapanai potter and beater and has dedicated much of her life to teaching these cultural practices to the local indigenous youth. My father is also a well-known drummer and singer, so I was able to attend various powwows by going along with him and, and dancing at those powwows. So since childhood, I've learned various cultural practices like pottery, beadworking, leatherworking, dancing, and those early influences led me to co-found Eastern Woodland Revitalization, which is a nonprofit that I helped co-found. 
where we share knowledge with other tribal members throughout our community. Raven Costello co-founded Eastern Woodland Revitalization with her husband, Chris, and her sister, Nokomis. The idea for the nonprofit emerged after Raven and Nokomis reminisced how their grandmother, Christine Rippling Water Costello, had held cultural classes for Mattapani children on Saturdays. My sister and I remember our grandmother held classes for all Native youth back when we were growing up. We would go to class on Saturdays, but there wasn't anything like that anymore. And we found a disconnect with ourselves and with our relatives. We just didn't have a place to go and practice culture together outside of powwows. And there was a lot of cultural practices that we weren't aware of or weren't well-versed in. Maybe some of those practices almost kind of died off. And we wanted to be able to authentically express ourselves as Mattapani people or as Virginia's indigenous people. So we're like, well, let's start classes and let's just see what happens. So we did, we started holding classes about once a month. Once they started holding their monthly cultural classes, Raven and her sister quickly found that they weren't the only Mattapani in their community who were craving a place where they could learn more about their people's history and authentically be indigenous people who practice traditional customs. A lot of times when you think about cultural classes, we automatically go to material culture, so pottery, beading, leatherworking. But it even goes further than that, too. We have songs that connect us to our spirituality. We have environmental stewardship practices. We're the first caretakers of this land, so ensuring that we're bringing that into our classes as well. There's, of course, incorporating language from our peoples in this area into our classes is important. So various aspects of what our classes entail, a lot of it has been material culture so far because that is the easiest and most successful thing we can do for people. Language, of course, is going to take a long lifetime learning and spiritual practices some people may or may not be interested in. But that's kind of where we're at so far with our cultural work. Although it started as a Mattapani project, Raven Costello and her co-founders have worked to ensure that the cultural work of Eastern Woodland Revitalization extends beyond the Mattapani people. We didn't want to limit this to Mattapani people only. A lot of us come from multiple tribes, and we're all relatives in some way. We see each other as relatives, whether someone's Mattapani or maybe from another tribe. And we have similarities in what our culture looks like and how we practice culture. So we really open this up to Eastern Woodland people in general. A lot of our cultural knowledge holders that come and help us teach these classes are from other tribes. We have Saponi represented and Wampanoag and many more. They come and show us things that maybe in Virginia we lost. So we wanted to keep this open to all Eastern Woodland people. When we say Eastern Woodland peoples, that can range all the way from Canada down south, east of the Mississippi. It's important to remember that each tribe is unique in their own way, but some of our practices are similar. In addition to helping each other bring back cultural practices, Eastern Woodland peoples are also helping each other reawaken their languages. My name is Tanya Stewart. I am a citizen of the Chickahominy tribe. I'm cultural resources director for the Chickahominy Eastern Division, which is located in New Kent County. The Chickahominy are located basically on the Chickahominy Ridge and also on Windsor Shades, which is basically Charles City, New Kent, James City area. We date back to being in this area over 12,000 years. Eastern Chickahominy branched off from the Chickahominy tribe in 1921, became official in 1925. Everyone gets along well. You know, there's no animosity between the two tribes or anything. Chickahominy is the word used to describe the people of the coarse pounded corn. There are two tribes of Chickahominy. The Chickahominy tribe of Indians, the tribe that Tanya Stewart is a citizen of, and the Chickahominy tribe Eastern Division. Well, as cultural director, I was brought in to help folks do things that we did traditionally with the beadwork, the pottery, the leather work, just making different tools and all. We as the Chickahominy tribe, we were able to do these things over the years as a group, but the Eastern weren't so lucky to have that. The Chickahominy tribe had a grant in 1978, and it was allotted to the Chickahominy tribal citizens that lived in Charles City County. 
So with those folks living in New Kent County, which is the Eastern Division, they weren't able to attend these classes. These classes, they taught us basic Chickahominy history, our dances, and how to do pottery, beading, and leather. I'm bringing that information over to the Eastern Division, where they had a whole generation that missed out on that. Like Raven Costello, Tanya Stewart's work as Cultural Resources Director for the Chickahominy Tribe Eastern Division involves organizing and teaching classes about different aspects of Chickahominy history and culture so that tribal members, young and old, can learn about and practice aspects of their traditional culture, like speaking their Algonquian language. We were speaking Algonquian fluently until the mid-1700s, but as colonization took over, we had to conform. We were misplaced from our lands, pushed back further and further, so then we were displaced. That's one reason tradition and language was lost. In all reality, it was much easier for us to conform than to try to continue to be ourselves in public. It was like we were wearing two hats. We were native at home, but we were colonized in public. So you weren't allowed to speak your language. You were punished for speaking your language. So why are you going to speak it out in public when you're going to get in trouble? You keep it at home. You keep it to yourself. And with it being kept, it just got dormant. We're a first contact tribe. Many East Coast Native people are among the first to be contacted by European settlers. And with that comes assimilation and genocide. A lot of our people, unfortunately, died because of either disease, warfare. Some of our people were sold into slavery. So just the physical decrease in our population is a factor. And then our people needing to survive over the last 400 plus years with European settlers has been difficult. Our ancestors had to make certain choices in order to protect what we had left, including land. And sometimes we had to give up some of those cultural practices and even our language to keep what we had left safe. They had to make choices so that we would still be here and still be relevant and be indigenous people hundreds and hundreds of years later. So some of those practices did unfortunately die off. And I hate to say die off. I like to say sleeping. They just were laid to rest, just waiting to be revitalized, reclaimed. Like the Chickahominy and Mattapanai, many indigenous peoples physically survived the laws, boarding schools, and other racist practices that worked to stamp out and eliminate their culture and traditions. And like the Chickahominy and Mattapanai, indigenous peoples are working to reawaken their dormant cultures with revitalization projects that seek to recover their traditional ways of life and their spoken languages. And the recovery of lost practices and languages, like the recovery or reawakening of the Senecomica Algonquian language, is often an intertribal effort. The project is involving several different Algonquian-speaking tribes here in Virginia. I'm a part of several language projects, but this particular one, the Senecomaca Algonquian one, is just several of us from different tribes. Talking with the linguist that's partnering with us, I think it's very important that we break this language down into something she calls Proto-Algonquian, and she's done that with another tribe in another state who has an Algonquian-based language. So breaking it down to that Proto-Algonquian and then looking at what we have from colonial documents, looking at other linguistic work, and then looking at our neighboring tribes who spoke similar dialects and seeing where we fit into that. We have lists of words from Thomas Jefferson, from John Smith, from John White, Lots of early personal accounts of connection with the natives in the Senecomaca area, which would have been the Monkey, the Mattapanai, the Rappahannock, the Chickahominy. It's important to be as authentic as possible. It's not going to be the exact language our people spoke 400 plus years ago, but getting it as close as we possibly can, I think, is important. I hope we don't go down a path where we're just using someone else's language and substituting words in because that wouldn't be authentic. As Raven Costello and Tanya Stewart explained, it takes a lot of work to reawaken a dormant indigenous language. Thankfully, many indigenous peoples in the Eastern Woodlands spoke some form of Algonquian, which means groups like the Senecomica Algonquian Language Project 
are able to turn to other Algonquian speakers to hear what the words listed in those colonial documents or remembered by oral traditions might have sounded like when the language was spoken fluently in Senecomica or indigenous Virginia. There are definitely still Algonquian speaking peoples up into the Great Lakes, even into Canada speaking Algonquian, but it's a different dialect. We're finding through some of John Smith's writings and Thomas Jefferson's writings, just how some of the letters or the words were elongated or shortened. There are some alphabets that we as natives just didn't use. By the word lists that we have compiled from several different writings. And then also along with those writings, some of those folks have written as it was a gurgle tone or it was a deep tone, you're going to have the different dialects. So someone could say Mattapani, and you're going to spell it how you think it sounds, how it sounds to you. But my neighbor five miles down the road, he could say the word Mattapani, and it sounds different, and then they spell it different. So it could be Mattapani, it could be Mattapony. In addition to helping each other recover their languages by sharing word lists and what they know about different dialects, Tribes are also helping their near and distant neighbors find the best ways to help people learn their traditional languages. I just met last month with some folks from the Suan speaking. So just trying to get in contact with them and just learn from them. What did you all do and how did you all teach? What are some of the different teaching tools that you all use? And that was one thing that we had picked up on when we had visited a tribe in North Carolina, the Halawasaponi, they're teaching their language as well. And they were using flashcards and just the kids were just having an actual Native American class where you're learning your skills, but you're also learning your language to go along with that. So working with other tribes, just asking, hey, what did you do? How can we do this? How can we do this better? What can we improve on? So, yes, it does help, even though they're not Algonquian speaking. Like their ancestors, the Senecomica Algonquian speaking peoples are having to make choices about their culture and their language. They're actively thinking about what Algonquian words to include from the word lists they find, what words and grammar they would like to borrow from other Algonquian speaking peoples outside of Virginia, and what words, pronunciations, or grammar they will need to exclude from their reawakened language as they rebuild it. As Raven Costello acknowledged, the work of rebuilding a language is a multi-generational project. It's not going to be the exact language our people spoke, but getting it as close as we possibly can, I think, is important. And I think that our ancestors will see that effort and I take comfort in the fact that when my time is done here and we join our ancestors in that spirit world, we'll be able to speak to them and they will understand us. So while I might not see it in my lifetime, maybe my children in my grandchildren's lifetime, it'll be a possibility. Tanya Stewart and Raven Costello do a lot of work to help their people reawaken their cultures. Both create and sustain communities by creating safe spaces where community members can practice their culture and just exist as indigenous people. They also use their personal knowledge and years of experience with beading, leatherwork, pottery, and spiritual song and dance to help their community members live and work authentically. But what about helping indigenous peoples exist outside of their communities? What opportunities are out there to help create more awareness that indigenous peoples still exist and play active roles in United States society? It turns out the educational and cultural initiatives that Virginia's indigenous people are working on extend beyond reservations and tribal communities. My name is Kara Kanaday. I am a citizen of the Chickahominy Tribe of Virginia. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Virginia Tribal Education Consortium. I am a proud graduate of Charles City High School. I'm also a proud graduate of Old Dominion University, where I received my bachelor's degree in speech pathology with a minor in special education, and also Virginia Commonwealth University, where I earned my master's degree in special education. So my experience in education took me to the classroom where I did teach special education for four and a half years. And within that time span, I was offered a position with this new up and coming tribal education agency, the VTech, where I am now. 
The mission of the Virginia Tribal Education Consortium is to build the leadership capacity of documented tribal nations in Virginia by serving as the tribal education agency to support academic excellence, cultural awareness, and historical accuracy. You will find tribal education agencies throughout the United States. However, they are limited to only one tribe, typically. So the VTech, we joined all seven of Virginia's federally recognized tribes together to create this consortium and serve all of our students throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. The Virginia Tribal Education Consortium is the brainchild of Ken Adams, the former chief of the Upper Mattapani people. Chief Adams sought to create an intertribal collaborative to help indigenous students in Virginia see themselves in the history and classroom materials being taught throughout the state. Our vision statement is that the VTech is committed to the facilitation of accurate Virginia Indian history, sovereignty, self-determination, and educational opportunities. Aside from the fancy words, we really saw a need in Virginia. Here in Virginia, we don't have tribal schools. Virginia has a very rich history. And the school systems don't always have the most accurate history books. It's not really the school's fault that the textbooks don't have what they need. So I've worked closely with teachers. I took my experience as a teacher and really listened to what the teachers needed academically. Do you need a worksheet? Do you need a presentation? I was able to create some professional development as well. So we have asynchronous professional development available on our website, which is meant to be very base level tribal history. The Virginia Tribal Education Consortium also works to shape the standards of learning, or SOLs, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The SOLs, that's really what's being taught. The public school system has to follow the SOLs as their base level curriculum. Again, that doesn't have the most accurate Indigenous history. In Virginia, fourth grade is really where you get your bulk of Indigenous education. Aside from that, you have your Thanksgiving lesson every year, K through 12, and that's almost it. Second grade as well has a few SOLs where they break down the Pueblo, Lakota, and Powhatan bands of Indians. That's another conversation we've had at the VTEC level and how we can assist teachers in understanding that Powhatan is not a tribe. Powhatan was a confederacy of tribes. The Lakota, you cannot just lump all of the various cultures within the Lakota tribes under one. So that's another way that the VTEC is trying to, in a way, right the wrongs that have been pen to paper put into a textbook. Now we have students growing up thinking, the Powhatan tribe, the Lakota tribe, when it's really multiple tribes. The VTEC is committed to helping ensure that the histories and stories told of indigenous peoples in the classrooms of Virginia are historically accurate. We start at the source. The VTEC is a very small but mighty team of 14 employees at the moment, majority of which are indigenous and not only indigenous, but members of Virginia tribes. So we're able to start at the source. I'm very excited to say my dad, I finally talked him out of the classroom, and he has joined on to VTech as our tribal liaison now. The man doesn't know a stranger. He talks a lot. <laughs> my great-grandmother, his grandmother, made sure she instilled in him the importance of our history. She wanted to make sure he knew his entire family tree. She wanted to make sure he knew what Chickahominy means, which by the way, Chickahominy means coarse pounded corn people. So I know he's a great source because he taught me all of these oral histories that his grandmother taught to him. That is what happens a lot throughout what we call Indian country. So again, we start at the source. Most of our employees, they have the same oral histories that my father passed down to me that his grandmother passed on to him. Oral history is so important. It is rooted within our culture, truly. Oral histories are embedded in indigenous culture, traditions, spirituality, and politics. 
Oral histories tell Indigenous people who they are and how they came to be who they are as people in the past and the present. Oral histories serve Indigenous communities in ways that are similar to how written histories serve Western societies. Only oral histories often go back further in time than written records and written histories. They also convey information about people in history that you often can't find in a written source. Oral stories were passed down throughout generations, and I like to really segue into this by giving a beautiful example of oral history. So there is nowhere I have found this written down. This is a story that my great-grandmother passed on to my father, who passed on to me. If you look at the Chickahominy tribe's flag or logo, symbol, whatever you want to call it, there's a turtle in the middle. The turtle is our quote-unquote animal, our symbol. My great-grandmother told my father that the turtle is our symbol because the turtle is the oldest and therefore wisest animal in the forest. Again, I cannot find that written in a textbook. I can't find it written on a sheet of paper at my great-grandparents' house that is still gratefully in our family. (laughs) It's just something that connects you to your culture. I wish I could just give you the feeling, the goosebumps that it gives me to even tell this story and to know it has been passed down throughout years within our family. So oral history is so important because it tells stories. Given the importance of oral histories to Indigenous people and the ways they reveal important information about Indigenous people, past and present, the VTech has started collecting and documenting oral histories so that teachers can use them in their classrooms and so that the Indigenous people of Virginia have the words of their people and elders. If you go to our website, VTech, and that is V-T-E-C-I-N-C dot org, we have a tab at the top called History. And you will find this incredibly long page of oral histories that were collected by our board members in VTech's early conception. We interviewed tribal elders and we asked them questions. For example, who is your tradition bearer or who and how did they teach you the most about your tribal community? Again, that oral history, it goes on and on. Somebody says their mother was instrumental to the tribe receiving state recognition because these elders have stories and they have proof that we were there that unfortunately it may not have been written down. It is breathtaking to read the experiences from our tribal elders who we have interviewed. And this was only the beginning. We're currently working on other projects that does write down these oral histories because our elders, unfortunately, it's a part of life. We all pass on. We don't want those stories to pass on with our elders. Not everyone was fortunate enough to grow up in a family where their parents or grandparents or great-grandparents continued those oral traditions. In addition to collecting and documenting oral histories, Kara Candidate and her team at the Virginia Tribal Education Consortium also perform what historians call triangulation. They read history books, examine the archeological and material culture records, and consult with scholars to fact check elements of those oral histories before they offer them as teaching materials. So these oral histories are very important to take down so that we can continue documenting. Right now, we have only directed folks to our website to view the oral history we have posted there. The other works that are in progress are exactly that, just in progress at the moment. But we do hope to continue creating modules for teachers. We hope to create asynchronous modules that teachers can assign to students or they can create as an interactive piece in their classroom. They may think they don't have access to accurate Indigenous history. A lot of teachers, and again, speaking from experience, don't even know where to begin. They may know there are Indigenous tribes in Virginia, but they don't know who, they don't know how many. And that's, again, because the textbooks, history is taught from the eyes of who had more power. We are taking that power back. I have personally worked on a history textbook that will be offered throughout Virginia. For the past 400 years, 
North America's indigenous peoples have been working to coexist with European and American colonists and settlers. Coexistence has not been easy. As the history and legacy of the Brafferton Indian School reveals, Europeans and Americans have always thought that North America's indigenous peoples should conform to their views of how society, laws, and culture should function. This is why the founders of the Brafferton Indian School worked to acculturate their indigenous students in the ways of English religion, language, and culture. They wanted and needed representatives of indigenous nations to understand English and later British culture with the hope that these students would communicate what they learned to their indigenous communities and hopefully bring them into the fold of English society, culture, and colonialism. When looking back at colonial era schools, like the Brafferton Indian School, later Americans decided that the United States needed to take a harder stance when it came to the acculturation of indigenous peoples. In the eyes of mid to late 19th and early 20th century United States citizens, the English did not go far enough in trying to anglicize indigenous peoples. They never demanded that the students of the Brafferton Indian School sever ties to their tribes. In fact, school and colonial government officials encouraged students to speak their indigenous languages and to keep some aspects of their tribal customs. Americans believed that this is where the English had gone wrong. To secure its claimed Western territory and to end warfare, Americans between the 1880s and 1920s believed that you had to kill the Indian by extinguishing indigenous cultures. And they used the Indian boarding schools they created to sever students from their tribes, their languages, their customs, and their tribes' communal ways of thinking. But indigenous people are resilient, and they have resisted American attempts to extinguish their cultures. The Indian boarding schools founded and supported by the United States government took their toll on indigenous culture and its survival. We can see this in the way that Raven Costello, Tanya Stewart, and Kara Canada describe the work that they and their tribes, communities, and family members are doing to help indigenous people reawaken and rebuild the customs, languages, and beliefs that have served their peoples for thousands of years. Long before English and American colonialism began dispossessing them of their traditional homelands, and the United States set to work on dispossessing them of their culture and traditions. In its oral and written forms, history tells us who we are and how we came to be who we are as a people. The history and legacy of colonial era Indian schools and the later United States Indian boarding schools help explain why so many in the present day believe that indigenous peoples and their cultures have entirely died out. History shows us that this is because the United States did attempt to wipe away indigenous peoples' indigeneity, the cultures, languages, and traditions that make them indigenous. With this in mind, I asked Raven Costello, Tanya Stewart, and Kara Canada what they wanted us to know about their present-day Mattapanai and Chickahominy people and indigenous peoples more broadly. I would hope people would understand that even though we don't have some aspects of our culture, it doesn't mean we're not indigenous people. I think a lot of times people assume, well, you can't speak your language, you don't know this, then you're not really an indigenous people. But the Virginia history for our people is very complex and very unique outside of just what happened in the 1600s, 1700s, even up till the early to mid 1900s, our people had to fight against Walter Plucker, who was changing our birth certificates to say we were no longer native people. You know, my grandmother, she wasn't even allowed to finish school. They could only go to school on the reservation up through the eighth grade. Anything further, they would have to go to a different state to a quote unquote Indian school. So our people faced a lot of hardships and our people had to make a lot of hard decisions. And while that resulted in some loss of culture, language, spirituality, it made it so that we still had our lands today, that we still have communities today, and that we are living in a time now where we are able to bring those things back. We're still here. We're resilient. We're strong. Our folks are smart and intelligent. I've always heard growing up, the dumb, stupid savage. We were always put down as being stupid and mean. And we're not. We're loving, caring people. We helped the colonists survive the first couple winters. We're the coarse pound corn people. So from that, you know, we helped the Europeans with growing of corn and how to live and how to cook it and how to survive. You know, that was a big thing. 
just knowing how much of an asset to society we as natives are in general. So many things that natives have contributed throughout history and throughout time that we don't get the recognition for. But again, we're still here and we're not giving up. You'll hear almost every indigenous person in Virginia say, we're still here. A lot of people believe that the Trail of Tears just wiped us all out. There are no indigenous people on the East Coast. Well, that's not true. Podcasts like this and the work that William & Mary and Colonial Williamsburg has been doing are really bringing light and showing folks that we are still here. You will find more information about our guests, Brooke Bauer, Raven Costello, Tanya Stewart, and Kara Kennedy, plus links to the revitalization work and projects on our show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash three, six, eight. Also on our show notes page, you will find a full length transcript for this episode and a bibliography containing the books, articles, and websites that we used to write this episode. Again, you will find those resources at benfranklinsworld.com slash three, six, eight. This episode was made possible because of the financial support of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and because many historians and tribal citizens helped me. I'd like to thank the William & Mary American Indian Student Association, whose members Matthew Solomon, Emily Magnus, Troy Wee Pongwee, and Dakota Kinsell donated their time and feedback to support this project. Their feedback improved my thinking about the scope of this project and they encouraged me to release this project in honor of Orange Shirt Day. Orange Shirt Day is an annual remembrance and commemoration day on September 30th. To create more awareness about the intergenerational impacts of Indian residential schools on individuals, families, and communities. My colleagues at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, Fallon Berner, Christopher Costello, and Felicity Mesa Luna, welcomed me to the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation with open arms and very quickly stepped in to help me with this project. Along the way, they taught me more about the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation's American Indian Initiative, the history of the Brafferton Indian School, and indigenous cultures. They also took the time to reach out to their community members, including those you heard from today, so that we could offer a well-rounded account of the Indian schools and how indigenous peoples are awakening aspects of their dormant tribal cultures. They also arranged for our musical guest. The indigenous music you heard throughout this episode comes from the Warpaint Singers. The Warpaint Singers licensed us the rights to use their music in this episode. For more information about the Warpaint Singers, visit our show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 368. The other musical tracks you heard in this episode were licensed through Blue Dot Sessions. Megan Kate Nelson kindly provided me with some reading recommendations about Western and United States history. Holly White and Joshua Piker also helped me think through early stages of this project. Thank you. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, Joseph Edelman, Katie Schinebeck, Ashley Bachnight Claybrooks, and Ian Tonat. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, what other aspects of indigenous history would you like to know about? Is there a history of a particular tribe or tribal community that you want to hear about? Is there something about material culture or other aspects of indigenous culture? Let me know. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.